Smith here at Audie Murphy. I'm actually um, trained in geriatric dentistry and um, and the director for the Gen Dental Clinic downstairs in the Community Living Center in Gen area. And this afternoon I've been asked to talk to you about oral health and aging. And so what we'll do here in the next 45 minutes or so is look at how aging impacts the the oral cavity, including the, the oral tissues, the bone, the teeth, and, and the oral mucosa. And we'll discuss the impact of aging on oral health and look at some of the more current data that reflects the impact that oral health has on systemic health. Uh, most of us are working here in, in an environment where we are doing uh, medical care of patients. We see a lot of patients with systemic disease functional limitations, cognitive issues, and so hopefully I'll be able to show you how all of this integrates and impacts um, oral health in our patients. Uh, the big thing today, is when we look at um, the oral health status of our, our older adult patients, we see that about 38% of all of them have teeth that are removed due to tooth decay or gum disease, you know, it caries and, and periodontal disease. And almost 25% of them have lost all of their teeth. Um, this actually sets them up to have functional limitations that start off with um, a loss of functional tooth units and an inability to masticate their food properly. So it's going to affect diet choices and, and nutritional intake. And as we all know, and, and we've heard throughout the week that, you know, uh, nutritional deficits in patients does affect systemic health and um, uh, dealing with systemic disease. So uh, the problem starts in the mouth and, and, and that's an issue that, that we have to try to address. Um, nearly one-fifth of our older adults have untreated dental disease. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few seconds here. And about a quarter of our older adults nationally that do have teeth that they've retained have what we call periodontal disease or gum disease. And as we'll tie in at the very end of the lecture, there is a strong correlation today between persistent periodontal disease and cardiovascular disease. Increases the risk for strokes is what's being suggested in some of the literature. So um, oral health actually, you know, there's a tendency for us to think, well, the mouth is out here, the body's over here, they're not related and what happens in the mouth isn't going to affect the rest of the body. Unfortunately, um, most of us, I see heads nodding, it does affect the rest of the body. The sad thing about it, though, is that as we get older, we lose the ability to pay for dental treatment and dental services, and we lose the ability to have access to routine dental care, and then all of a sudden, an emergency hits, and the emergency becomes a major expense for the patient, which they don't have the resources for. So it's a vicious circle. Medicare doesn't reimburse for dental treatment. Very few third-party plans are available for older adults. Once you leave the workforce and you leave your health insurance, there's no dental insurance. Many of you maybe don't even have dental insurance. You all have health insurance if we can, but how many actually have dental insurance now while we're working? Um, so again, uh, the, the continuity of care, preventive maintenance is just not done in the oral cavity. Um, if we look at the older adults that are maintaining their natural teeth into their later years, the current data from the CDC is showing us that as we get older, we have more and more people that are maintaining their natural teeth into their later years. A lot of that stems from the fact that dentistry as a profession has had extreme success in preventing disease or slowing disease progression. We've had active preventive programs with children starting at the early ages of looking at how diet influences tooth decay and soft tissue health in the mouth, uh, frequent brushing, routine visits. Uh, many states like Texas have the CHIP program where children actually are funded by the state to see dentists on an annual basis. So there's a lot done in the early years to help maintain oral health. It's when we get older 
and we think things are stable, that things start to go downhill. And, and that's a, a challenge for us in the, the dental community, as well as the medical community, that's managing patients that, that have dental problems. Um, as far as utilization, we can see that the utilization for dental services is great between the ages of, of five and, and up to about 55, 64, and then it drops down you know, exponentially as they get older. And, and a lot of this, again, is the finances. And as people develop functional or cognitive limitations, their access to care becomes an issue. If they're in a wheelchair, how do they get from their home when they're in a wheelchair to the dentist's office? Now it involves coordinating and maybe adding extra expense on having a bus service come to pick them up that has a ramp that takes them into the vehicle. Um, we see patients in our clinic that can't even sit in a wheelchair. They're gurney bound. How many dentists in the community see dentists in a gurney? Not many, if any, because our offices aren't designed to take gurneys in. But if the patient can't sit, they can't sit. That becomes a limitation in access. Um, some of the barriers to care include the cost of dental treatment. It'd be nice to say that, that um, we could do it at a discounted rate. Unfortunately, the overhead of maintaining a dental practice is high. The dental equipment is expensive. The dental materials are expensive. You have staff that we have to pay, so all of that comes into that model, and, and there is a fee that has to be charged for service. Um, and, and that becomes a, an issue as we get older because we don't have that disposable income. Um, lack of perceived need for care. How often have I heard, well, my grandmother had pyrrhea, she lost her teeth when she was 35, and after 35 she didn't have a dental problem. Well, they don't have their teeth, they're 85, but none of the teeth are in good health. They're mobile, the, the bone loss is gone, the soft tissue support is gone, and they end up requiring having to lose all of their teeth and have them replaced with dentures. And the bottom line is, is that I don't care how experienced the dentist is with making dentures, dentures never replace natural dentition. I have not had a patient in all my years that comes back and says, God, these dentures are the best thing to, you know, best thing after whipped cream or, or sweet butter, okay? They all say the same thing. My food doesn't taste the same. I hate them. They fit well, Doc. They look great, but I hate them. And so when patients ask me, um, do I have to brush my teeth? Because the bottom line is, is daily oral hygiene is the best prevention. My favorite little remark to them is, yeah, just brush the teeth you want to keep. Okay, and if you want dentures down the road, I'll be happy to make those for you. They'll, they'll look really good. Um, functional limitations. Um, what's the number, what's one of the highest chronic or number one chronic medical conditions that affects people in this country over the age of 35? Number one chronic, or it's up there in the top two or three. Hmm? That's in this part of the country, not on a national level. Yeah. Arthritis. Arthritis. Arthritis is the number one chronic medical condition that's treated. If you look at the top prescriptions in this country, if you look at CDC tables, arthritis is right up there. It used to be cardiovascular disease was right up there. And actually, arthritic conditions have um, some of the tables now surpassed that if you look at insurance companies and what they pay for. So all of us notice that there are signs and functional limitations that occur usually mid to late 30s that progress as we get older, depending on if there's been trauma, uh, genetics, uh, risk factors that maybe <coughs> accelerate the, the degenerative changes. But along with that, we notice, and some of you may notice, that you know when I grip things, I don't have the grip like I used to. I used to be able to open the pickle jar with no problem. Today I gotta get one of those little rubber things that you stick on top of the lid to help get a little better grip. 
so that I can open the lid of pickles. Functional limitations can start very subtly, and they're very minimal. That impacts our ability to hold a toothbrush. Or if I have pain, if I have osteoarthritic issues in my hand, if I have rheumatoid arthritis, if I have fibromyalgia, I'm not able to maybe grip my toothbrush like I should. And I may go through the motions of brushing my teeth, but I'm not effectively debriding the teeth because I don't have that good functional grip. So functional limitations right off the bat can do that. Another interesting thing is that there was a study done here at the Health Science Center about 15 years ago. And we were looking at oral health and basic health of the patients. And one of the things that came out of the data was that people who had lower extremity weaknesses had poor or poorer oral health. They had higher plaque scores, more periodontal disease, okay? So let's think about that for a second. What would be the association between lower or weak, lower extremity strength and poor oral hygiene? Most people stand to brush their teeth. That's exactly right. Because since you were a little kid, and you went to the dentist, and they taught you how to brush your teeth, they told you you stand in front of the sink, and you brush your teeth standing in front of the sink. This didn't sink in my head until I was down in ECTC about 22 years ago when I started. And I had a patient who came in and had plaque all over their teeth, and this elderly gentleman had 24 teeth in his head, a good number, almost all of them. But he had heavy plaque. And I looked at him and I said, are you having a problem? Can't you hold your toothbrush? And he looked at me and he said, don't you see I'm in a wheelchair? I had my knee replaced. So what does that have to do with you not brushing your teeth, sir? I can't stand up. Can't you see? And the connection was made. We con were conditioned to do our oral hygiene standing up at the sink. And so when we get to a point where we get a knee replacement, or uh, we have hip surgery, and now we're relegated to a wheelchair, all of a sudden, that's the reason we can't get our teeth, we can't do our hygiene, because we can't get to the sink with the wheelchair. So functional limitations extend. So as you work with your patients, you have to start realizing that there are certain things that we're conditioned to do that when we lose that functional ability, we can't do anymore. So the, sim the solution was simple. You know, you can brush your teeth in your wheelchair using a couple of cups, one with water, clean water, and one to spit in. And it made the biggest difference. Oh, well, no one told me that. Well, sometimes we have to be told things. You know, we all know that. So th those are issues, again, that we find. Transportation problems we talked about and fear. Okay, how many of us really like going to the dentist? Okay, in here, raise a hand. <laughs> Who just looks forward to that annual dental visit? Everyone's going, no, oh, yeah, no. Yeah. I'll tell you a little secret. I became a dentist because I was so afraid of going to my, my dentist hurt like you know what, okay? And I was so afraid of going to him, but I realized that I had to go, and I thought, you know what, I'm gonna go to dental school and I'm gonna learn how to do dentistry so I don't hurt my patients. And maybe then I'll be able to, to get over the fear, because what do they say, the conquer fear, you have to face fear in the face. Okay, so went to dental school and here I am all these years later, and I still don't like going to the dentist. I hate getting my teeth clean, okay, fear. And that keeps a lot of us away from the dentist. But it's one of those things that you got to do. So when we look at the aging oral cavity, what we see is, we see, and the data tells us with the NHANES and nutritional, national nutritional studies that are being done for the last 15, 20 years, from CDC data, there's a lot of published data that as we get older, we see tooth decay on the rise. And that's because we've done a good job teaching people how to keep their teeth but once they get debilitated, once they get sick, once they get on multiple medications, things start to fall apart in their mouth really fast, and they get dental de decay. 
gingival and periodontal disease kind of the same way. You know, we may hold on to our teeth, but then as we get a little older, we find that the hygiene isn't there. Um, you know, I was tired. I heard that from a patient this morning that I saw. I was really tired the last couple of nights. I came home late, and I just said, you know what, I'll brush my teeth in the morning. But I get up in the morning, and I'm late because I slept in, and I had to come here for the dental appointment. And I'm sorry, Dr. Ponovich, I just didn't brush my teeth for two days. You know, and this is a relatively young patient this morning. So, um, you know, life gets in the way. Tooth loss, if you're not going to brush your teeth, if you're not going to watch the foods that you eat, you will lose your teeth. And tooth loss is a big issue. 25% of the older adults in this country today still have almost all of their teeth missing. Um, again, that affects nutritional intake. And then oral mucosal changes we see with aging also. Now, there's host factors. The ability, and you all know that with all of your patients with systemic diseases, their ability to fight off inflammation, infection, is really independent on host factors. What their immune system function is, how it's functioning, do they have other systemic conditions that are, are impacting the, their immune system to respond to disease. This whole thing today in, in medical science about chronic inflammation in the bodies, C-reactive proteins, you know, they're around. So we may have inflammation in one part of the body that causes these proteins to be manufactured and they're circulating in our systemic circulation and maybe impacting other systems without us realizing that. Um, other host factors include habits, smoking, diet, high sugar. These variables will affect the oral cavity just as they do the systemic conditions. Um, the other issue the other issue here is risk. So you have things that we do to ourselves, we have the normal aging process, and then we have risk factors that increase our risk for dental disease, just like systemic disease. Not being able to take care of ourselves, having to um, depend on somebody else for care, having to depend on someone else to get you from point A to point B, uh, becoming institutionalized, going into long-term care. Um, not a good environment when it comes to preventive care and daily nursing maintenance sometimes because the needs of maintaining all of the medical conditions takes priority and somewhere the oral cavity just kind of gets to the bottom of the list. And if we have time, we'll take care of it. But if we don't have time, oh well, we'll just deal with it tomorrow. And those tomorrows keep coming without interventions on a daily basis, and that's where dental disease sets in. So let's look a little bit about what naturally occurs with aging, independent of disease, independent of daily home care. We do know that as, as we age, the enamel on our teeth, which is the outer layer of the teeth, the hardest layer of the tooth structure, it, it wears away. It's just wear and tear. If we brush a little bit too hard, if we use a hard toothbrush, it may wear away faster. Um, we see attrition where people, because of bad bites, bad habits, like grinding their teeth at night, clenching during the day, will wear away enamel and tooth structure. So teeth start to get jagged edges, they start to get short, they may crack, they may break, and, and that's part of that, that continued process of change. The one thing that sort of gets under my collar here is teeth naturally are yellow, they're opalescent, and with age they yellow, teeth stay harder. Teeth are not supposed to be fluorescent white. <laughs> Fluorescent white is a Madison Avenue, New York public relations thing where, you know, you have the magazines and stuff to make the models look younger, what do they do? You know, young kids, you know, 12, 15, 16, 18 years old, 21, have beautiful whitish teeth. 40 and 50 year olds don't have fluorescent white teeth, okay? And we know who you are when you smile if you're getting them bleached, okay? Um, 
The problems with bleaching are that there's safe products and then there's not safe products on the market. And the good old American way, if I go to Sam's and they're having a special on this tooth bleaching kit that's $29.95, and the dentist told me it was going to cost me $129.95, well, I'm going to buy that bleaching kit at Sam's for $29.95. Never you mind that the acid is probably a lot stronger in that $29.95 kit. And then the other American way, if a little is good, a lot is even better. So instead of the 10 minutes that the instructions tell me to keep it on, I'm going to keep it on for half an hour. Yeah, my teeth get super white, but they get really painful. They're very sensitive to cold because now I've even dissolved some more of my enamel away on my teeth. So those are issues again. Yes, ma'am. No, those are okay. Those are kind of benign, but there's some kids on infomercials and that that are, are advertising these kits. And, and really, I'm a firm believer that that's one area where you really want to have, if you really want them done the right way, have professional um, uh, assistance in that area. Uh, because if you use some of these kits, the little strips and all, they're designed to be relatively benign, and they'll do it, but they don't do it as well as an in-house. You're going to spend a lot of money on strips before your teeth get white enough to your happiness as opposed to just going to the dental office and having them do it there. Okay. Um, so, so if we look at um, uh, other changes with the teeth, they get more brittle. And that's because there's actually a blood vessel supply that each tooth in your head has. And as everything else, as you start to get teeth get knocked around, you know, when we're kids, we fall off a bike, we get punched by our classmates, um, you know, we run into things. Uh, all those little impacts of trauma actually cause those blood vessels to recede a little bit, and that's part of the natural aging process, too. We see that in our other extremities, our hands, our feet. And so teeth, as, as that blood supply decreases, teeth become a little bit more brittle. And teeth I always equate to porcelain, fine porcelain. Not, not much different. The older china that you have is a lot more sensitive to, if you knock it, it might chip a lot faster than it did when you just got it 20 years ago. Because the, the heat, the cold that the dishes are exposed to, just like the teeth in our mouth, there's going to be expansion and shrinkage, and over time, that makes teeth a little bit more brittle, and they'll break. So the clinical impact of these are, well, you're going to end up with patients that have sensitivity and pain. If you look at that top slide here on the right, that's a nice set of young, healthy teeth. If you look at the second slide there in the middle, you can see that the um, Enamel is this really white area on the very periphery of the tooth. And then the very yellow area is actually exposed dentin. The enamel is totally gone. And uh, the attrition that we talked about is this third slide, where you start to see the loss of tooth structure with exposed dentin. That can happen from grinding. That can happen from people that have gastric reflux disease or maybe systemic reasons that they have that. So there's, there's a host of other variables. So teeth become a little bit more sensitive to thermal changes. They may hurt when they have extreme temperatures that, that uh, they're exposed to. We increase the risk for tooth decay now when dentin is exposed because dentin is, is a lot more pervious than enamel is. So the acids in our mouth and the bacteria will actually break dentin down a lot faster than they break enamel down. It may end up losing a tooth because of that tooth decay or if you crack it bad enough. And then ultimately as we start to lose a lot of teeth, the relationship between the top and the bottom jaw changes. We overclose and now we start to get pain in our joint areas in the jaw. So those are all things that we see on our older patients as they come through the clinic. 
When we look at tooth decay, some of the risk factors, poor or no oral hygiene, diet, gingival recession, we may be brushed too aggressively and we abrade the gum away from the tooth surface, we expose a root surface. We make that root surface now much more vulnerable to tooth decay. We may be taking a lot of medications. A lot of our veterans, this after, yesterday afternoon, I had a patient with 31 prescription medications. 31, polypharmacy. His mouth is like a desert, it's so dry. That's not a good environment because he's lost his saliva. And remember, saliva has buffers in it. It has something called immunoglobulins that actually help break down the nasty effects of bacteria in our mouth that cause tooth decay and gum disease. So all of that protective mechanism that saliva provides to the tooth structure when it's gone, makes that patient much more vulnerable to tooth decay and gum disease. And then if you add on top of that the inability of them to brush their teeth because of functional limitations, now you really set up the, 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 the secret storm here for tooth decay and, and gum disease. Not a good situation. Um, systemic disease, I mentioned GERD, diabetes is another uh, uh, situation where we see patients that are immunocompromised, they're much more vulnerable to soft tissue, gentle tissue loss, and bone loss. And um, again, functional limitations is, is another common risk factor. So when you start looking at your patients and you see th these areas, here they've abraded away the, the enamel and even the dentin, they've started to notch into the, the, um, the dentin, uh, exposing the dentin, which is softer, to the acids, the sugars in our mouth that are all the, that interact together to form tooth decay. Uh, you can actually see these areas of tooth decay all along the gum line. When you see these areas, you can actually see how the plaque just accumulates right along the gum line. So when you're doing your assessments, the nurses and physicians in here, you're looking in their mouths and you see that plaque. You might want to gently remind them, you know, it's really important that you brush their teeth. If they've got issues with the grip strength, you can recommend uh, an electric toothbrush. You can actually buy some decent electric toothbrushes over the counter now. They don't have to be those fancy Oral-B toothbrushes. Colgate, Crest, they have those little battery sonic operated ones for about $5.99, $7.99. You know, and, and recommend those if they don't have the ability to actually brush their teeth. Or better yet, include that in your caregiver instruction. If their ADLs are at the point where they require assistance for their grooming, oral hygiene is part of the ADL assessment. So if they can't shave themselves, if they can't comb the hair themselves, if they can't button, they don't have the dexterity to do their own oral hygiene. So we need to educate the caregiver to actually do that for them. And there's some wonderful resources online where you can actually get caregiver instructions for simple things like brushing and flossing on, on patients. And if, and if you don't, can't find those, just email me and I will be more than happy to send you the links for those. The clinical impact of dental decay, well, we get um, uh, pain. There's nothing worse than that, that cavity going to the nerve of the tooth and that can be excruciating, um, can't eat right, that may now compromise your patient for diabetic control issues. Um, it may, uh, for other uh, uh, inflammatory factors, so it's really not a good thing for them to have a lot of difficulty too long. A tooth can abscess as a result of that cavity, and so now you have an abscess in the alveolar bone, which is not only painful, but can get into the systemic circulation. This isn't good for patients that have had joint replacements, that have had valve replacements. So, you know, they're at a higher risk for septicemia um, of an oral nature, and, and that's not good for them. Tooth loss, again, is another sequelae, and you lose a tooth, you have to look at replacement. But we go back to the finances. How many patients can afford having a denture made or a partial made? 
you know, so they may go edentulous and just gum the food. So those are our other issues. Again, that's going to impact food choices and those things. The periodontum, this is just a little slide that goes over what the periodontum is, and I'm sure when you've gone and had your cleaning, the dentist explains that the root sits in the alveolar bone, it's covered by the soft tissue. If we let plaque sit on that soft tissue in our mouth, the byproducts of the bacteria that's in the plaque form a byproduct which actually dissolves the soft tissue attachments. It breaks down the collagen, it breaks down the fibers, so the gum gets red, swollen, that's an infection, and then long-standing chronic infection starts to break away the attachments, so the soft tissue starts to shrink away, and as the soft tissue shrinks away, we get bone loss also. So the bone will trickle down. So we can go from having a nice normal high bone height, this yellow area in the interceptal area, and with severe periodontal disease, it shrinks down to where maybe only 20 to 25 percent of the root structure is actually supported by bone. These are the patients that come to you and say, my teeth are loose. They're loose because there's nothing left to hold them. And I hate to tell you all, but and I hate to tell the patients, when they get loose, I can't tighten them up. I don't have a gasket that I can put in there. I don't have a, a wedge that I can put in there. They have to go. They can be perfectly healthy, no tooth decay, no fillings. But if that hygiene hasn't been there over the years, and this isn't just a recent onset. This happens to people that in their 20s and 30s, the process starts. So this is a chronic dental condition. It's not a condition of the elderly. We see it in young adults. And once you have gingivitis and once you have periodontitis, those bacteria from that disease process even if you finally go get routine dental care and you're really religious about your hygiene, that flora is established, that colony of flora is established in your mouth. And as soon as you slip up, guess what happens? It gets active again. So periodontal disease can have kind of a curve where it's stable for a while, and then maybe your diet gets bad, you don't brush or floss like you should, and so then we'll see periodontal disease increasing again with clinical signs of gentle inflammation, soft tissue inflammation, bleeding on probing. When you brush your teeth, you'll notice a little bleeding. And then you get back to the dentist, you get everything cleaned up, you say, you know what, I'm going to buy a water pick, I'm going to floss, and then you're okay again until you get into the hospital, you have surgery, now you're dealing with pain and you forget about your hygiene and the whole process kicks in again. And every time it kicks in, it gets more aggressive and it takes longer for that process to stabilize. So it, it, it's not a pretty picture. Risk factors for periodontal disease are not that much different from dental decay. Poor or no oral hygiene, tooth movement or loss, Diet, multiple medications that cause dry mouth again. So dry mouth is a big problem. Systemic disease, like diabetes, GERD, those are the two that come to mind. And then again, functional limitations. So if we look at gingival and periodontal disease, about 40% of ambulatory older adults have gingivitis. So if you, one out of every two patients that you see for sure, and in this population, it's just about every patient that we see has gingivitis. 33 to 60 percent have measurable periodontal destruction, and we measure that when we take our little probes and we look to see where that soft tissue and bone level are. Um, we see a lot of gingival recession when they smile. You'll see their gum line should have been up here with their bone level. Now it's down there. They've lost the attachments that kind of anchor that tooth, and so now you've got tooth mobility, that tooth is starting to move, or they'll drift. They'll drift. A lot of times, uh, some of my older patients will ask me, when I was young, my teeth were perfectly straight. Why are my teeth so crooked and they seem to be caving into the front? Well, periodontal disease, if it's the bone shrinking away, teeth naturally drift 
towards the center. And that happens as we get periodontal disease, and then they're going to be moving back and forth as they're drifting, depending on how much bone loss we have. So the clinical impact here is that we get pain, we increase our risk for infection, we have uh, trouble chewing our food now because the teeth are moving, so when we masticate, we can't really load that pressure to, to chew and masticate the food. Um, we have increased bone loss, which then keeps that disease process continuing. Um, we expose the root surface of the teeth, and the root is the most vulnerable part of the tooth for tooth decay. Many patients that we see in our gem clinic have never had a filling on the crown of the tooth, but they come in with tooth decay on the root surface. And dentistry, it's very difficult to restore tooth decay on the root surface. If it's small, it's one thing, but if it wraps around the whole root, it's an honor. There's just, we don't have the materials that will stick to that tissue. Plus, as that bone shrinks away, and as that tooth moves, there's more flexion in the tooth, and it pops fillings out really easy. So that's a little battle that's very hard for us to win. When we look at the alveolar bone itself in, in, with aging, actually there's been several really good research papers done in the last 15 years that say when we look at, you know, we all know that we're going to lose bone mass as we get older. I'm sure you've heard that this week already. That's part of the aging process. Actually, one of the, some of the first places that we see bone loss mass with aging is in the mandible. So we can actually, when we do our panoramic images, we can already see bone mass changes in 50-year-old, 60-year-olds. So as those changes hit, we can actually see it. Um, we can actually look at um, resorption that happens. If they, a lot of bone resorption is genetically tied in, and a lot of it is also tied in to hygiene and the presence of periodontal disease. So those factors will actually accelerate alveolar bone loss. The other challenge comes in is that I hear patients that say, well, my mom had pyreo when she was 50, she lost all her teeth. I'm 65, and so if I have to lose my teeth because of periodontal disease, that's okay. But mama couldn't wear dentures. So does that mean I can't wear dentures? When I hear someone tell me that, the answer to that patient's going to be probably so. And the reason is that if you have periodontal disease and it's active, which means that the gums are red, they're swollen, the teeth are really movable, you know, you can just kind of wiggle them. That's active periodontal disease, gums are red. When I take those teeth out, I have that active disease, that chronic disease bacteria in their mouth. I expose the alveolar bone to the oral floor in the cavity. Some of that bacteria is going to still be there in that bone socket. There's no way for me to totally sterilize that bone from the, that bacteria. So as that bone is healing, we're going to see more remodeling of the bone because of periodontal disease, the defects from the disease itself, and the bacteria, which means that the mandibles or maxilla will resorb even more, as much as 50% of what it was on the day that I extracted the teeth. So that renders me with an alveolar ridge that is really small, thin, and I can't really sit a denture on top of it. Those are the dentures that some of your patients have that kind of float around in the mouth because the ridge is like a really flat plane. It doesn't have the contours for a denture to sit on top. That's why dental implants have come into being to help stabilize some of those dentures. But dental implants aren't the answer for everybody. Not like Clear Choice wants to make you think that you can go in in the morning with no teeth and come out that night with a beautiful deck of teeth with dental implants. Not that easy because if the bone shrunk down enough, there may not be room to put a dental implant in. And then you have to have bone grafts. 
in other surgical procedures. So it's not a slam dunk with dental implants either. Dental implants are great for that one tooth loss or a few tooth loss, but full mouth restoration becomes a whole different story. Plus you're talking about big bucks. One dental implant on average is about maybe $3,000 for placement. And then the crown, you're talking maybe about another $800 to $1,200 today. So you're looking at anywhere from five to $6,000 per tooth. And it's, it's not any different than doing a knee replacement because we've got to get the metal, the titanium. You have to have, that's where the expense is in. It's in, in that implant. So again, you know, thinking that you can lose your teeth and have them replaced may not be as easy as we think. Um, if we look at tooth loss, risk factors we've talked about, um, let me, the clinical impact when we lose these teeth, we can't chew our food. If we can't chew our food adequately, and I think the person following me is going to talk more about dysphagia, um, and I'm sure they'll talk a little bit more. If you can't chew that bolus down enough, you're going to have trouble swallowing it even if the muscles, your swallowing chain muscles, are working well. Um, you'll end up with nutritional deficiencies because food choices are, are going to keep you away from the grains, the whole grains, the crunchy fruits and vegetables that you should be eating. You may end up having swallowing difficulty because that bolus is just too large. We've talked, I've already mentioned that. And one of the things that happens is that you can't communicate like you used to because our teeth are used for phonetics. Our tongue has to hit up on some of the, the consonants that we pronounce. It hits up on the back of the front teeth or on the sides. So if you lose those stops that the teeth give the tongue, patients have a problem communicating and that can be frustrating for them. We see that when we give them new dentures because they've been without teeth for so long and then they get teeth and it's really hard to speak until they get used to it. So those are our challenges. Um, it can affect their facial appearance. They can have a really sunken look. A lot of our, our patients are excited when they get their dentures and the first thing their spouses say is you look 10 years younger because we fill things in again. You know, because our teeth and our alveolar bone actually give us facial contours. Um, the impact on social interactions. I can't tell you how many nursing facilities I've gone to, and patients will sit there and they'll, they'll stay in their rooms because they're embarrassed socially to go out and interact with other people because they have a funky or no smile. No teeth in their smile. They have really rotten teeth or they know they have bad breath and they can't do anything about it. So social interactions are, are impacted. Tooth loss going to edentulism. Um, we talked a little bit of some of the risk factors with dentures. Um, the earlier the patient is and the more aggressive periodontal disease is, the more resorption of the bone there will be. The more resorption of the bone there is, the less likely there is for a good denture fit to be successful or a partial denture fit. Um, as we lose teeth and you have bone loss on adjacent teeth, sometimes that periodontal disease is so aggressive that we take a few teeth out. Now the patient are using the remaining teeth to chew. They try to really masticate everything they can, but what do they do? They start loosening up the adjacent teeth. So we actually see more tooth loss. Uh, dentures and partials can traumatize soft tissues. We see uh, fungal infections because dentures and partials are not removed and cleaned on a nightly basis. Number one cause for candidiasis in the mouth is unclean dentures, oral thrush. Patients don't disinfect their dentures on a nightly basis. They stick them in the denture cup to soak. That denture cup hasn't been changed for a week. So they got a little science experiment there at the sink with the denture cup. If any of you are on the wards, important. Those denture cups need to be emptied every time the denture goes in the patient's mouth. 
rinsed, cleaned out with soap, and let them air dry. And then when the denture goes back in, fresh water, and that's fine. I know some of you are going, oh, gross. There's nothing worse than getting a thrush infection when you're immunocompromised. That's pain. The tongue will burn, the mouth will burn, it'll impact your ability to eat. It's not pretty for the patients. Not pretty at all. Um, oral mucosa can, uh, changes. Uh, as we get older, the epithelium in our mouth gets thinner. It loses vascularity. It's not as firm, just like everywhere else in our body. Um, connective tissue changes aren't any different. <clears throat> the tongue probably doesn't have much vascular changes. That's one of the things that we see doesn't really age. So, so that's, that's a good thing. But risk factors when we have thinning epithelium, um, loss of fibrous connective tissue, that tissue is more vulnerable to disease. It's more vulnerable to ulcerations and it's more vulnerable to having a longer time for healing. Healing takes a little bit longer. So those are issues to, to talk about. Dry mouth, xerostomia. Top 200 medications prescribed in this country, 198 of them have xerostomia as a side effect. That includes all of your cardiovascular medications, all of your antipsychotics, many of the pain medications, you get the drift, almost everything the patient takes. Now, it, it's, this is a misconception. Salivary glands don't stop working because we get old. Our research in dentistry has demonstrated to us that hypofunction of the salivary glands is not age associated. But it is associated with medications and polypharmacy. So we have to recognize that, and as we're looking at our patients, look at the oral health impact. Diabetics, we know, that's one of the systemic condition that actually sets your patient at a greater risk from having xerostomia also. So when you're doing your assessments, look at their mouth. Signs of xerostomia, if you look at the tongue, all of the nice velvet papillae that we have on our tongue get denuded and the tongue looks very flat and bald, if you would. That's a sign of xerostomia. Start to suggest saliva substitutes to the patient. Make sure that they have teeth, that you tell them you need to have routine dental evaluations because they're at a greater risk for tooth decay, as you know now, periodontal disease. A lot of them develop the little ulcerations on the commissures of their lip called angular colitis. That's actually, we find a fungal infestation of candida albicans in these areas. And that's secondary to xerostomia. So they're more susceptible to thrush infections or candida infections, they're more susceptible to angular colitis. So we manage those with nice stent ointment. And they're more susceptible to rampant caries and tooth erosion. So we talk about the implications all the same. Oral pathology as we get older, oral cancer is at the greatest risk in our 70 and 80 year old adult population. What we find unfortunately is that because of limited access to care, because of limited finances, they don't frequent a dental office enough to have a oral cancer screening. This becomes a problem because if they have risk factors like alcohol and smoking, especially smoking, the number one oral cancer is squamous cell carcinoma of the tongue. I can't tell you how many veterans I've seen in these years here at Audie Murphy, downstairs in palliative care and in hospice, that is, not a, that is probably the most miserable deaths that I've seen when these patients deteriorate with squamous cell and it gets into the throat, the floor of the mouth, disfiguring because of the surgery, then the chemotherapy and the radiation oncology treatments on top of that, the side effects of those are terrible. Quality of life is not that great. It can all be prevented with routine screenings.
for oral cancer. Even patients that have no teeth are at risk. And they probably are even at a higher risk because smoking is the number one risk factor for, after oral hygiene issues for periodontal disease. So again, um, if we know they have high risk factors, we need to suggest to them strongly, you need to have an annual exam. Some of the treatments that we use are our priorities for treating these conditions in patients is that number one, we want to eliminate pain. We want to eliminate infection. We want to restore function when possible and restore aesthetics if, if they request it. But you can see that with oral health and aging, you've got the natural progression of aging with the dentition. But if we add systemic conditions with functional limitations, cognitive changes that decrease as they get older, increased number of medications, we've increased that risk for dental disease. I'm going to stop here because of the time, but for those of you here, I think we're all VA employees. Is that right? Mostly. Mostly? Okay. For the VA employees, not every veteran is eligible for dental care in the VA. That's not the dental services rule, that's VHA ruling. If the veteran is not eligible for care and access to care, money is an issue, there are community clinics in the city. There is the dental school across the street that has a geriatric dental clinic. They take patients there at the clinic. They can put their, their treatment on a payment plan. They work with the patients. There really should be no excuse for saying, well, the VA can't do it. Because what, what I hear a lot is if the VA won't take care of my teeth, I'm not going to take care of it myself. Patients need to understand that this is risking their other health conditions. And if we can't do it, we can't do it, unfortunately. It's not that we don't want to do it, but with the number of patients and the number of providers, it just doesn't happen. In the community, those of you that are community providers, look to the Dell School, look to community, the Brady Green downtown. Great place for extractions, and they're doing some, some dentistry down there too. There are community clinics to help older adults out in the community. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, number one is I actually recommend that a caregiver be trained to do the brushing for them. As far as, and the question was what's the recommendation for a TBI patient um, for brushing their teeth? That maybe can't do it, can't swallow, has swallow, is a high risk for aspiration. Let me just backtrack a real quick second. If they're a high risk for aspiration, they have teeth in their mouth and they have plaque in their mouth, they're at higher risk for pneumonia because of aspiration pneumonia because of the plaque in their mouth. So my recommendation is you take a toothbrush, dip it in something like alcohol-free Listerine so that it's got some of the, you don't want it soaking, but you want it dampened, and get in there and just brush their teeth. And I would have a caregiver, whoever does the grooming, the bathing, uh, be trained in that area. Who does the training? Um, well, I can give you, a, the, the CDC has a great website that has these pictures that actually show the caregiver. And if they're a, if they're, are they in the HBHC program? Um, if you come and let me know, we'll see that we can get someone out to the house to, to do the training from the dental, uh, from our dental folks if we can. Okay. But I can give you the material that you can give the caregiver. It's amazing, caregivers read this because it's designed for the non-trained professional. So it's really, really easy and I'll give you the link and we can actually print some of those handouts for you. So when you're down in the clinic, let me know. Yes? Well, now hydrogen peroxide gets rid of materia alba, like little food particles in the mail. Mouthwash is something that's antibacterial. There's a lot of good products on the market. Because dry mouth is a situation that we see with older adult patients, 
I'd recommend the alcohol free because the alcohol in the oral rinse is actually will burn the mucosa, so it's not a comfortable feeling. Um, the Listerine, the Crest Oral Health Guard product line is really good. Biotin makes a really good um, oral rinse if they've got dry mouth problems. So those are all, all good recommendations. Um, there is a false sense of security with uh, hydrogen peroxide rinses. It really just takes care of materia alba. And it's not an alternative for not brushing. Any more? Okay. Right. Yeah, one more? Yes. What kind of gum to chew? Yes, no, Well, you know, if you can chew gum, chew it. If you have dry mouth, a gum with xylitol, and it's the number one ingredient, that's a sugar uh, sweetener. Uh, xylitol has been shown to have anti-cariogenic properties, which means that, that it ha it, when you chew it, the, if you have some of the bacteria in your mouth that make cavities, it actually dilutes the acid effect of that bacteria, so you won't get tooth decay as fast. So xylitol, so things like Trident, Carefree has it. If you look at the gum that you're buying, that has artificial sugar or sweeteners in it, and if xylitol is the first ingredient, that's a good gum to chew. And if you can tolerate chewing it, people have other issues with, with TMJ pain and that type of thing, or their teeth will hurt if they chew gum. So if, if it hurts, don't chew, but if you like chewing gum, do it, but make sure it's sugar-free and it's got xylitol in it. Okay, we're done, thank you.